is the prelude that Darlene uh, played at the beginning of the service were both very important pieces to me in 1978. Praise to the Lord the Almighty was played at our ordination service at Timothy Eaton United Church with David Ochterlone at the organ, Darlene. Absolutely wonderful. And uh, that last one we just sang was, uh, do you remember, Fred? <laughs> that was our processional at our wedding day the same year. <laughs> Let us pray. God of transfiguration, this morning we come to the mountain. We open our minds to the thought that you are near. We open our eyes to look into Christ's face. We open our hearts to be filled with your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. you can come up. Come on down. You're the next contestant. Graham, yay. Hi, Brenda. How are you? You look beautiful today. You've got sparkly shoes. Do you think they'd fit on my feet? No? Do you want to have a sit? Why don't you guys sit down? Graham, why don't you sit on the first step? You want to sit with me? No. Everyone's welcome. I don't bite. I haven't bitten people since I was like two. You're going to go back with Daddy? Where are you going? You've got to go either with Daddy or with us. Rules. We have rules. 
Okay. He's going to sit with his friend Sawyer. Hey, how are you? My name's Heather. Okay, I've got a story to tell you. I bet you your name is Marlene. Marlene? some chocolate bars. I would have bought some chocolate bars. Yes, please bring some chocolate bars. No, I, I'm not. Oh, Mila. Oh, yes. I No, Mila's a little one. No? Yeah. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, so Claire has a friend. Graham's everyone's friends. Okay, I have a story to tell you, and I want you to ask, I'm going to have a question at the end, okay? I'm going to sit down because it's been a long week. So on Thursday, some people have heard this story. On Thursday, I was working, and I was working very, very hard. And my doorbell goes off on my phone, and I thought, oh, I got a parcel. Yay, I've got a parcel. And I knew what it was. I knew what it was. And I got busy. So I kept working because that's my job. And I finally got home at like 10 to 7, and I went to get the parcel off the front step, and it was gone. And I thought, I don't think this is that heavy, but I looked on this side of the porch, turned the, the light on, I looked on this side of the porch, I looked in front of the porch, I looked on this side of the porch, I looked on my neighbor's yard, because usually the wind goes this way in my house. There's no parcel. The box was gone. So I looked on my app, because yes, we have apps. Who knew? I looked on my app and I saw the camera. And I saw that not only did I have one box, but I had three boxes and they were all gone. And then I saw another clip and I saw two people taking them and leaving. Porch pirates, yes, you're right in tune. Yes, these porch pirates were, were, were pretty young. I'm thinking high schoolers, if that. So anyway, well, I'm getting to that because it gets kind of funnier. First of all, do you think Taking someone else's boxes off their step is right or wrong? Wrong. Wrong. But it wasn't theirs, was it? So they shouldn't have taken it. Nope, it was wrong. It's stealing. That's what it is. It's stealing. I was pretty steamed. I'm not so steamed anymore. I'm still kind of steamed, but not so steamed. But I thought, I, I thought, it's my, and little trinkets, people. Like, they got stuff that they'll never be able to use. But the one box, I, the cord is too long. Can I have a do-over for today, please? Okay. No, you can't have that, Graham. No, yesterday was a very good day. Yesterday was an awesome day. Brown for leaf clover. Still, you were able to see the grass in February in Ontario. So, the one thing that was really funny about the boxes that were taken, yes, two were Amazon. The other box was our daily bread devotional books. <laughs> they stole from God. They stole God's word. I'm hoping they read a few pages before they realized what they had. Oh, thank you. What, what you doing? That's a better view, isn't it? Okay, so, is stealing good or bad? There's one time when stealing is good. Oh, look at the face. She's going, what? It's when you steal someone's heart. You don't even know that you're stealing someone's heart. When you guys were born, even before you were born. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Before you were even born. You stole your mommy and daddy's hearts. And when you were born, all the rest of the family, your grandparents, your siblings, your cousins, your aunts and uncles, you stole their hearts without even knowing. What's, what's Wednesday? 
February 14th. Valentine's Day? Valentine's Day. So we're going to go downstairs and we're going to make a couple Valentines for some that you want to share with. Okay? Because we have stolen our parents' hearts and our family's hearts. Are we giving it back? Oh, no. We, we, we can always give love back because who taught us how to love first? God and Jesus. That's right. Both. Both. All the time. Both. So we're going to have a prayer and then we're going to go downstairs. Yes. I love unicorns. Okay, so let's have a prayer. And then we'll go downstairs and we'll continue with love in our hearts. Gracious and merciful God, we thank you. We thank you for these energetic kids in our lives. We thank you for the love that we feel in our hearts for them. And because of them, we thank you for the love that you've shown us and the love that you and your son Jesus teaches us every day, even when things go bad, even with por when porch pirates come on your step. We thank you for the love that we still share with other people knowing that love is good and love will always win, no matter what. And we say everything to you and to your son through the prayer your son taught us to say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, we have to take our time downstairs. We join now in singing hymn number 808, uh, Psalm number 191 on Eagle's Wings.
scripture this morning is from Mark, verses 2 to 9. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he really didn't know what else to say, for they were all terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus with them. As they went back down the mountain, he told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. When the earth began, the Bible says, it was covered with darkness. It was God who said, let light, let light shine out of darkness, and there was light. When the Bible talks about darkness, it is the darkness that cannot believe in God. It is the darkness that says there is no God. It is the darkness that refuses to see the light of the gospel. Today is the last Sunday in Epiphany the Christian season that started on January 6th. It was the day that the Magi visited Jesus and was made manifest, uh, Jesus was made manifest to the Gentile world. Today, the last Sunday before Lent is called Transfiguration Sunday. The light that shone over the humble town of Bethlehem when Jesus was born in December now shines again. The timeline of our Christian calendar can be a bit difficult to understand. Children have often asked me how it is that Jesus was just born, and now just a few weeks later, we're beginning for him to die. Today, we actually stand at the halfway point between Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River when he was about 30 years old and his resurrection. At Jesus' baptism, the heavens opened and God spoke to Jesus saying, you are my dearly loved son. With you, I am well pleased. Now after traveling around Israel, teaching and healing, Jesus is preparing to conclude his journey by going to Jerusalem. And he pauses for a moment to take three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, up onto a mountain to pray. And while they're up on that mountain, the bright light of God shines once again upon Jesus. His clothes are changed or transfigured into a dazzling white. The disciples see Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus, and then a cloud overshadowed them. The disciples now hear God's voice speaking to them. Similar words that God spoke to Jesus at his baptism. This is my dearly beloved son. But now he says to Peter, James, and John, listen to him. Listen to him. And tells them to follow Jesus down the mountain. Now, according to the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this event is the most definite revelation of Jesus as Messiah prior to the resurrection. It's not easy for our Western minds to understand what is happening here. The transfiguration is more about truth and less about facts than we can understand. In the give and take of our lives, the challenge for us from this scripture is to transform ourselves, and then as a result, transform ourselves with transfigured seeing. Transfigured seeing. Where do we see the breaking in of the holy in our own experience, where do we see the breaking in of the holy in this community? And how do we respond to it? Why was it that Jesus went up the mountain that day? And what does it mean for us? 
We have to put ourselves in Jesus' place. He had to make sure beyond all doubt that he was doing what God wished him to do. Jesus had to make certain that it was indeed God's will that he should go to the cross. He didn't want to go to the cross. Jesus went up the mountain that day to listen to God's voice. Jesus had already told his disciples that only a few days earlier that he was going to have to suffer many things. He would be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law and be killed. On the third day, he would be raised to life. He was surely praying about these things and about what it meant for him and his friends. What was going to happen to the disciples? When his face began to shine and all around him a bright light radiated. In the midst of that light, we are told that Moses and Elijah appear. They're speaking to Jesus about all that's going to happen to him. Peter and James and John who were, as usual, nodding off, wake up enough to see Jesus in this glorious moment. Sometime after the disciples are fully awake, Moses and Elijah depart. As the prophets are leaving, the disciples try to prolong the special moment by suggesting to Jesus that they build some shelters for him and for Moses and Elijah. I think that the disciples suggest this not for their own sakes, as has often be, been suggested in, in our, in our uh, commentaries. I think that the reason um, that they did this was because they knew the real Jesus, a Jesus who, like us, because they'd watched him, they'd watched him, must often have gotten tired. A Jesus who, like us, must have often felt the need for rest and encouragement and support. It was not to be, however, for as with all the visions of prayer and gifts of exceptional grace that God bestows on all of us, that moment passes, and then the next moment of our life arrives, whether it's going back to cleaning our house, going back to our day jobs, um, all kinds of things that we have to do, the mundane chores that we have to do. Perhaps it's taking care of our parents. Perhaps it's it's taking the children to lessons, different places. What happens next to Jesus and the three disciples is familiar to us. No sooner than Moses and Elijah depart and the light of glory begins to flade, a cloud sweeps over the place of transfiguration, bringing with it once again the very ordinary world. All that is left to the disciples of the moment of glory that they have overseen and overheard is now a memory and a voice that speaks to them somehow from the cloud that they are in and tells them, this is my dearly beloved son, listen to him. Those few words don't seem much somehow, but it is when we treasure it, they are when we treasure it, as they are meant to be treasured. <coughs> Every one of you sitting here has had a profound spiritual experience in your life. It could be associated with an inspiration from a concert or a theater production that you saw. Perhaps it was sitting on a beach, watching the ocean, up on a mountaintop, riding your bicycle or your motorcycle through beautiful country, visiting a special ancestral or historical place, the birth of a child, or a deep intimacy that you share or have shared with a lover, soulmate, or best friend. But like the disciples, we subsequently have to go down the mountain after that experience. The vision that was once so clear inevitably becomes somewhat clouded. And we lose faith in it. We lose patience waiting for it to re-emerge. What can help us keep it present through time? We need to reassess our own understanding of our lives in the present moment by what can be called transfigured scene. It has been my privilege to be with people who are aware that they are about to die. In the midst of their prayers and their sufferings, their trust in God has given them a moment that has convinced them that everything would be as it should be. A moment in which so much peace was given to them that it allowed them to say to their families that everything would indeed work out as Jesus had said it would work out. Some of you 
have had the experience of waiting with a loved one who has insisted that they are sure that Jesus or God or an angel has visited them in their sleep and comforted them and told them what they should do. The sense that this person had of being taken by the hand and shown their approaching death and the glory that lies behind it. If you are fortunate enough to have experienced this not uncommon phenomenon, recall the sense of well-being and faith that watching your loved one be transfigured there did for you, did for you to give you courage and strength to go back to the mountain to return to life. Now indeed, that is really what a funeral or memorial service is about. We come to pay tribute to the person who has passed away to honor their life, to honor the things that they have accomplished, to honor the things that they have done for God and for Jesus. But it's also, if the funeral is done well, it should also leave us going out with hope. As we hear that person's life and the way they have touched others, it also reminds us again of all the potential that is ahead for us, for all the things that we can yet do for the time that we have left to us, the ways that we can transfigure and transform our life and the lives of the other people around us. We can call these moments glimpses of glory, moments in which the world, like Jesus' word on the mountain that day, is transfigured. It was a time in which Jesus was confirmed in his mission, a time in which he was encouraged now to continue on in the confidence that God was beside him and that the prophets were beside him in all his joys and in all the sorrow that he was going to meet as he went to Jerusalem. The transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain that day was an opportunity for God to give him strength for his own death. Being clothed in that divine light, our Lord knew that his death wasn't going to be the end. He had a foreshadowing of the resurrection when he would once again live in God's light. If you've seen some of the movies about the Jesus' last days, almost all of them and portray in some way at the end that beautiful light that comes from Jesus, that beautiful light. And this day of transfiguration was the day that was helping him to see that once again that was going to happen for him. But you know, friends, this is not the only kind of glory we are able to glimpse in this life. It's not just around death that we get to experiencing something special from God. When John Newton, who had worked selling slaves for a living, wrote his immortal words, I was blind, but now I see. His transfigured seeing produced a social and political transformation in society, as well as his personal one. The context of Jesus' ministry 2,000 years ago was the brutal oppression of occupied Palestine under the Roman Empire. In our own time, right today, we continue to witness the pain and misery all around the world where people are living in unacceptable human circumstances. Tomorrow would actually be the 217th anniversary of the abolition, abolition of slavery in the Western world. 217 years ago, that declaration came down. Yet, in our world today, there are 20 million slaves. And there are wonderful people that have worked together in a growing abolitionist movement to rescue slaves from Cambodia, Thailand, Peru, India, Uganda, South Africa, and Eastern Europe. Good people like you folks at Central increasingly advocate for human rights. You are part of developing organizations that provide social services and legal advocacy for victims of all kinds of misfortune. In my short few months here, I've watched continually how you reach out to people in so many different ways, day by day, week by week. With your transfigured seeing, you reach out to provide healing and justice for so many in this community. The most recent project, now I don't know if this has got around to the congregation or not. I know the council um, is now involved with a, a new project at Holy Trinity Anglican Church in Welland. Has the congregation heard about that yet? No. Okay. Is it okay if I stay? Yeah? 
Okay, um, the, 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 there's actually a Holy um, Trinity Anglican Church um, in, in Welland um, has been aware of the growing number of homeless people that have no place to go. And there isn't at the moment um, a, a, a permanent facility. So Holy Trinity Anglican Church um, has opened their doors to provide a temporary shelter for uh, the folks in Welland, but there is not such a place also in, in Port Colburn. So for people in Port Colburn who need um, this kind of a, of a shelter and food and friendship, um, they are going to provide this. And the council has just recently uh, decided that they are going to give $750 toward this project, as well as um, already, I know some folks here in the congregation, um, I've already brought coats and other kinds of clothing because they need all those things as well that have already been delivered um, to Holy Trinity Anglican Church. Now this is just one more way that the congregation here is doing the work for Christ. We come into the season of Lent beginning with Ash Wednesday this week. This is the season where we gaze upon both the good and evil in our own hearts and in the world. Christ is inviting us to live with transfigured seeing as he calls us to carry the light into the places where not only we see it, but others see it as well. Our Christian journey is a lifelong journey. Sometimes it's exciting and dramatic. More often it's routine and mundane. Occasionally it can kind of stagnate. And unfortunately at times it can be even confusing and painful. Lent has a very special place in this respect. It is the time when we are most keenly aware of the transfigured Jesus call for us to become nothing less than his own divine glory. We are invited today, each one of us is invited to climb up to that mountain. The transfiguration is a foreshadowing not only of the resurrection of Jesus, but of the transformation of the whole cosmos. It is the sign, the sacrament of the new creation for which our world so desperately waits. The glory of God is not confined to that radiant vision on the mountain. If we can believe, the Holy Presence travels with us whether we stand on the mountaintop or walk through the valley. We will speak and act with transfigured seeing all of our life. May God be with us to guide us. <coughs> Thank you. 
while our hearts and minds may be transformed by sacred stories with words or beautiful music like we just heard, it is through sharing generously that we are releasing our gifts into the world to transform others. We give with a prayer that our generosity will not only help us feel connected to God, but our gifts will transfigure. They will flow through our faith community and into the world to prepare the way for God's kingdom. The offerings will be received. help us tap into the deep faith of Elijah, Moses, and Jesus. Through our giving, expand our hearts and help us create transformation in the world, in our homes, and in ourselves. Amen. Let us join our hearts in the prayers of thanksgiving and concern. O oh God, we gather with you remembering Peter, James, and John upon the mountaintop, and we pray for our, your transfiguring presence in our lives. We thank you for daily glimpses of your grace and abundance, for indeed your light breaks forth through life's clouds and shadows, and the splendor of your presence grants hope to our present. We thank you, gracious God, for the way you have dazzled us with the depth of your love for the human family shown in the person of Jesus Christ. Help us to see the beauty and brightness of each day in family and friends, in affirming remembrances, in those who love and accept us as we are, in the difficult people in our lives who, whether we realize it or not, are the soil of our growth and in strangers who greet us with kindness. Even in the barren days of winter, the new life you offer us in Christ lives. Wherever the poor are fed, the homeless sheltered, the grieving comforted, and the worried and anxious friends in our own congregation are given hope and peace, we feel your touch. We see your way and know the abundance of your compassion for us. In knowledge, we turn our thoughts to others, to your world where darkness hovers under this, pen, <clears throat> under this very difficult time of children shedding tears, to your creation that groans under the weight of greed, and to your church that seeks your way in the world. Becoming strong in the light of your love and standing firm, we give you thanks for all the goodness and hope that still prevails, for the new babies being born, for the children and teens learning and discovering joy and mystery around them, for the young couples celebrating new love, and for those who have been together many years who are celebrating anniversaries and the love they have shared over decades. Now, dear God, we pray in our own church family for Catherine, Ross, Penny, Sue, Theo, and Deanna. We remember Betty Piniak and her family, 
who have placed flowers for William in the sanctuary today. May they be blessed with the wonderful memories of that dear man. We think about Rahim in Bangladesh. We know that that country is suffering at this point, and we ask that you be with our young friend and helping to know that our thoughts are with him. As you gathered Peter, James, and John on the mountain, gather us, then lead us to the world's valley that we may become instruments of transformation and peace in our world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Our final hymn this morning is number 586, We Shall Go Out with Hope of Resurrection. have been gathered in the presence of God and we have been changed by God's power. God is calling us again down from the mountaintop and into the world to work and to witness. Let us go together.